Michigan finds itself amid another offseason controversy. Shemi Schembechler in, and now he is out on the next Locked On Wolverines. You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Monday. It is the Locked On Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I am your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. And let's get into this Shemi Schembechler of it all. Uh, in case you missed it, the, the hire of Shemi Schembechler as the assistant director of recruiting lasted all of three days. Uh, there were a lot of uh, Twitter likes that were discovered by fans that led to his downfall. Uh, Can't say Michigan took swift action. I have a lot of very, very nuanced uh, things to kind of discuss with this. So I hope that you'll stick with me, that you won't take me out of context. I am not trying to cancel myself here, but I have a, I have a very, uh, some, some very direct opinions about how uh, this whole thing has gone essentially. So in case you missed it, uh, Shemi Shembeckler, I'm not going to recount any of the Twitter likes or what have you that he, uh, that he liked. And while I do think it is a little odd that, uh, it's Twitter likes that are derailing, uh, someone's professional path. It is the world that we live in today. And certainly it's a window into the soul to some degree. Uh, and, uh, he, there were some that he, that were certainly racially insensitive and it's what's disappointing more. So I think is either Michigan didn't do its due diligence to know that this was something, cause they say they did a background check. They said they do all those types of things. Um, I understand son of Bo Schembechler, maybe they didn't feel like they needed to really be very diligent when it came to it. Uh, but, uh, e- either Michigan knew or Michigan didn't know, and either is more of an indictment on the athletic department. I think that that is a completely separate issue as to uh, some of the uh, some of my thoughts. But Michigan should know better, right? It should know that if if someone's out there liking things that are at very the very least racially offensive, sensitive or insensitive, rather, uh, that that's going to come back to bite them. Uh, I, I'm of the mindset that they didn't know that they didn't really do the due due diligence. And, uh, that is what, this is what the result is. So, um, it's more egg on the face this off season and an off season that's come with, I don't have a problem with Jim Harbaugh's NFL dalliance. I do think that that was more of a leverage play. It's funny. I was reading some, some stuff over the weekend about how, uh, James Franklin was doing the dalliance with the uh, with USC and all of these things in order to get more resources for him at Penn State. But Jim Harbaugh, who knows? Right. It's like. The benefit of the doubt doesn't tend to go both ways. Right. Um, I do believe that that was the case, though, for Jim Harbaugh. But then the Matt Weiss situation, Matt Weiss being uh, ousted for alleged computer crimes, that one's a little bit seemingly more cut and dry, but it is alleged. Um, But what I want to talk about when it comes to this is I want to share a little bit of my own personal story. For those of you who don't know, I'm half black. Um, I, this is kind of a weird thing to say, but I looked more black when I was younger. I've experienced my fair share of racism throughout my life, uh, a lot less now. Um, so, I mean, while I'm very thankful for that, I, I do have a different opinion than a lot of people maybe have. And where I want to get to that, that point, I want to start by discussing grace and forgiveness. Um, Shemi did put out a statement today and he uh, did exactly that, asked for grace and forgiveness. Uh, He came out and said, uh, you know, it, what I did was wrong. What I did was insensitive. What I did is, you know, certainly hinders uh, the legacy that, that my father left behind the one that I want to leave behind. And it's, uh, 
and it it certainly uh, flew in the face of my life's goal of helping black families. Um, because you do have to recognize that that's he's he's certainly been around black families. But I, I with that in mind, I mean, and he mentioned uh, like Pierre Woods and some that he's friends with um, that they you know they were disheartened by this, but also that they believe what's in his heart and all of that. Um, and I think that we can take that at, at face value. I think that we should allow grace to people. Now, this was put out by a PR firm. Uh, which I don't really have a problem with. I don't think that uh, I think that something of this magnitude probably would be right. But at the same time, uh, I, I very much and maybe this is me speaking on a cultural on, on the cultural world at large. Is that we need to be a little bit less vitriolic. Uh, I do think that everyone's going to learn a lesson at one point in time uh it, not necessarily about this exact thing, but they're gonna. Everyone goes through something, does something that's wrong, that aggrieves other people, offends other people. There's probably not a human in existence that hasn't done something, right? Um, and that's why I kind of call for grace, because you can treat things as one of two things: as a moment to shame or as a, a moment to learn. Unfortunately for Shemi, he is in a learning situation, uh, and perhaps that's what he needed, right? To, to take a look in the mirror and understand, all right, there are some things that have to change. Uh, there are some things that, uh, that I, I can't be, I, I can't do things a, a certain way. And that is, or I can't think, think the way that I've been thinking per se. Um, but it sometimes it's I, I think about this a lot and I apologize because I know that I'm probably not um, I'm probably not being as eloquent or articulate about all of this as I, I would like to be. Uh, but I, I, there's something about I, I had this conversation uh, with a uh, with a very notable former Michigan person uh, once upon a time uh, when a lot of the BLM stuff started coming forth and I it, it, and it all had to do with someone being kind of shamed into into having the, the you know the right thoughts and like I said that's not really an, a good way to go about really changing hearts and minds because that all that's going to do is it's going to essentially in a lot of a lot of times put lipstick on a pig or even harden someone's heart that much more. So it, it, it's one of those things where I feel like the important thing when it comes to a situation like this is while Michigan had to make the move, I mean, he resigned. It was clearly a forceful resign resignation. Um, Michigan had to make the move. They could not you know, being in the university, having as many black athletes that are on the team, all of that kind of stuff, it makes 100% sense that he would not be able to retain his position at that point once all of this kind of came to the forefront. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't forgive at this point, right? Like, it, it should not continue beyond this because we need to live in a culture where grace and forgiveness is crucial. We all make mistakes, some way worse than others. Um, but more so we need to be a culture of grace, uh, because we are all fallible. We, at what, one thing that I really believe and or like is anathema to someone else and vice versa. It's unfortunately the way of the world. I'm sure there are plenty of you who don't like the hat that I'm wearing. For those listening, I'm wearing my traditional Jesus is King hat that I wear almost every episode. Um, and certainly you can have different beliefs and opinions of, on, on plenty of different other topics. Uh, I'm going to do my best and I'm not saying this to be on a moral high ground because this, it's a daily challenge. It's a fight to love you anyway. You know what I mean? Um, I'm going to try to draw this out a little bit more make it a little bit more coherent. Um, I have some personal anecdotes about this. Uh, not to be on a soapbox today, but I think it's uh, it's something I've been thinking about all weekend. 
So let's continue that this conversation here in just a moment. Looking for a delicious snack, but don't want all of the sugar and calories and you need the best tasting protein bar ever built. You've got to try this. If you're like me and you want to make healthier snack choices, but you don't want to compromise on taste, well, I've got just the thing for you. Built Bars and Built Puffs. Built Bars are healthy and taste amazing. Seriously, they taste so amazing, you won't think they're good for you. You've got to try this. What makes Built Bars so good? Well, for starters, they're covered 100% real dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And let me tell you, they're amazing. I, I have a box that if you watched or listened a couple weeks ago, I bought it right here on the show. It, it came Last week, I had multiple. I try to space it out because I will eat a whole box all at once. I will. Uh, they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and cookies and cream. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. What's even better that they're healthy. Only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering Built Bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or at Sam's Club while you can still get your specialty flavors at Built.com. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section. Grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream bar, double chocolate bar, or coconut puff. If you're close to a Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hip flavors, brownie batter puff, and churro puff. You can thank me later. I'll tell you, I'm trying not to have a case of the Mondays. <laughs> it's, it, I don't know what, why Mondays are difficult for, for people. And it's, I mean, I do. I worked at, when I worked in Hollywood. Um, you know, it was like 60 to 80 hour work weeks. You had the weekend off. You might have still done a lot of work, and, but you've got that time off. Um, and then you uh, and then you have to go back and start the whole thing over. My job now is not like that. Right. It's like a work every day, pretty much thing. But sometimes it's still the case of the Mondays. And it's not that um, I'm not trying to say like. I'm, you know, downtrodden or anything. I'm not. It's it's more of a getting back into the swing of a week for some reason. It's uh, which uh, meaning articulating certain points is more difficult on a Monday than it is for me on a Friday. Um, so I'm going to try to do my best. It's it's weird speaking. It, it's a muscle sometimes. Uh, so I'm trying to do my best to be able to uh, to give this uh, the, the right conversation without being too mismatched all over the place. It's uh, very nuanced. Um, changing hearts and minds is something that I want to get into. Um, I don't know that Shemi necessarily changed his heart and mind overnight. Maybe the negative consequences did have an impact. I, I often don't believe that negative reinforcement is a true uh, soul changer. So, um, and I, I do want to, I want to go back real quick and say, I didn't see a, a lot of what the Twitter likes were. I saw a handful of them and I mean, it, they were the types of things that no, you, you can't, it, they, it's especially in today's culture in today's climate that the things that he liked, there's no room for nuance. Um, and it's, it looks bad. He does point to the fact of the relationships that he's had with uh, people in the program, black athletes, his desire to help the black community. What he what he liked, unfortunately, does not help that. And you have to be thoughtful and mindful of those things uh, on social media and uh, just in the world in general. Um, I don't want to act like none of like we all have perfect starry social media accounts either. I'm sure that if I went back to when I started a Facebook account in college in 2004, 2005, I'm sure that I was saying some ridiculous things, certainly not racist things. Um, but I'm sure that there are things that were objectionable. And for that, I asked for grace. Because we all grow and we all evolve as people, at least hopefully we do. But when, I, when it comes to changing hearts and minds, that's always been something that I've cared deeply about. 
And the reason I bring this up in this particular show is because I've seen the uh, Torch and Pitchfork mob on social media. And I detest that as much as I do the Shemi's likes, right? Like it's, I don't, I don't appreciate when people get on a particular high horse and start to get to this point where it's like they're th- th- without personal consequences, essentially are calling for someone else's destruction. Uh, I do again, want to be clear. I don't believe that Shemi, given the, uh, what he had done was going to be long for that Michigan job. It just doesn't, it doesn't fit the puzzle pieces. Don't, they aren't in the same box, but I also think, and this is why I think grace is needed. We all falter and we all err because we are human. And when it comes to racism, I understand there is very much a no tolerance policy in this country. And it's understandable that that is so I have a different approach and all I can do is is share it and hope that maybe uh some people it it that they reevaluate how they go about it because I don't really believe that shaming someone really truly changes them it might make them more outwardly uh falling in line but I don't think it necessarily actually changes their heart so uh I have two stories that I'm going to share and uh I'm going to try to keep them relatively brief uh, I think just due to time, we'll do one here and then one in the next segment. Uh, but back in when I was in going in between sixth and seventh grade, I believe it was uh, my family took a, an RV, my grandma and grandpa, and then a couple of cousins of mine, um, my other aunt and uncle and a friend of mine from uh, from my school. We went to Port Huron for a week, uh, stayed somewhere lakeside by Lake Huron, and uh, we stayed there. Now, there was this kid. Uh, I was, so I was probably like, what, 12, 11, something like that. I was pretty young. There was a kid that was, uh, wearing a Megadeth shirt, really soured Megadeth for me because, you know, I made an association at that age. Uh, and it took a, a good five years before Megadeth became one of my favorite bands, uh, which it eventually did. And, uh, but he, every time he saw me, he would, uh, call me a racial epithet. And uh, that's the first time that I ever really had that in my life, Um, just being confronted directly with it. It was very confusing for like an 11 or 12 year old or whatever I was at that time. I think I would have been 11. Um, Very, very confusing to uh, to have that, uh, especially someone who seems so much more mature. Right. A 17 year old to an 11 year old or a 12 year old, whatever I was, uh, comes across as a in being in a position of authority and they every time they saw me they would utter this racial epithet and i didn't treat it though like you know like i uh, i obviously told my family and i was like i don't know what you know what this is all about but i didn't treat it as this person should be expunged from society i treated it more of i'm going to show them that they're wrong I'm going to show them that they they are just they don't know what they're talking about. They that they're misguided. They were there all week, and for the majority of the week, I mean, they you know what every time they'd see me, they would call me this racial epithet. And uh, by the end of the week, other people witnessed this. Obviously, it was just much more acceptable in 1992 or whatever it was. Um, as the week went went on. It, I don't know that I fully changed this kid's heart, but just because I was unflappable to it and just continued to be myself amidst it, and I was a very happy-go-lucky kid, uh, he stopped calling it, calling me that, and he just seemed to be a little bit more around, but not like in a dangerous way. Now, that is a very small portion of the story I'm trying to tell here. But that was the first time that I I looked at it as I'm not going to change this guy's mind. Granted, he's bigger than me and all of that stuff uh, by shouting him down and, you know, getting everyone else to shout him down. Um, but that was the first real story of of that. Now, I want to continue with a more impactful story here in just a moment. 
make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. So if you're betting on the Celtics or the Lakers, yes, I know this somehow, <laughs> then you might, then you're going to get your money back. So, I mean, the great thing about FanDuel is they've got great promotions every day, a safe and secure app, and you can get paid instantly. I mean, there's nothing better about a betting app than that. You want to get paid immediately once you win some money. So there's no better place to bet on all of the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, hopefully I'm going to tie all of this together. I don't know that I'm doing the job that I hoped to do, but we're, we're working on it. Uh, so changing hearts and minds. I, I think the most, uh, I mean, there, there are two more important stories. That was just the, the rec- recognition that that's the best way to go about it in my, in my personal view. And I know there's probably a ton of people out there that disagree with me. Um, and you're welcome to your own opinion. Uh, This is my lived experience and the way I choose to go about it. I just hope that I can bring more people with me in this. Um, But um, so I I also want to note that I was born into, uh, you know, I'm born of a white mother and a black father. Uh, That was not necessarily super acceptable even in 1981. And I had I had several family members that were. Uh, very racist at the time that I was born. And I'm very thankful that they, when they got to know me as a baby and as a child, that uh, they completely recanted on on how they felt about racial relations and, and all of that. Not everybody. I certainly had people in my family that were accepting from uh, before I was born and all of that. But um, I, I think that the most impactful story for me is when I got my first real girlfriend, I'm talking first serious girlfriend, um, I was, uh, 19 years old or 18, 19, I was 19. And, uh, she had told me, you know, straight up, like, I don't know if I can date you because my father is openly very racist. And she would, you know, she started by telling him all, all about me, all the, the gentlemanly and chivalrous things that I was doing. And, uh, he started to relent. He still called me a racial name when even, you know, I hadn't met him yet or anything. And, um, he, so he started to relent. And, um, when I first met him, I mean, I, I was called names and it was, uh, you know, un- more than uncomfortable <laughs> to say the least. But again, I wasn't going to take this. You should have your entire life ruined mentality. Um, I had more of a let let's show him that he's wrong. And it was a multi-year situation where it really took took, you know, a lot of my energy and uh, me being who I am and all of that. But he slowly and slowly started to recognize that his misconceptions were exactly that that he was wrong. Uh, a sad part of the story is that his daughter died uh, while I was with her. And, uh, but afterwards, we still maintained a relationship for a while. And, you know, he, he had apologized and he had said how he had seen where he was wrong there, that he, uh, just like Martin Luther King would say, uh, really come to treat people on the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. It's if someone is legitimately racist, it's it's a sad thing. It it really is because they're not looking at an individual. They're taking whatever weird misconceptions they have and pigeonholing an entire group of people. And that's not right. I do want to make sure that you, everyone knows that that's where I stand at. It's not right. But just like anything else in this world that isn't right, there are certain lines we certainly draw, right? As far as the the people we give grace to. Um, I would say that we probably should not give grace in our culture to people who are physically violent. You know, that that's a, a hard line we have to draw. 
But when it comes to what people think, that's something we can change. And in order to be able to change, we need to be able to have conversations. And sometimes they're tough conversations. We need to be able to show the content of our character. I hope for to tie this all back together. I hope that Shemi Schembechler has learned his lessons. I hope that Michigan athletics, Michigan football has also learned its lessons. But I also don't want to see someone ruined because they are completely misguided. What I want to see is that person to no longer be that. I want to see that person grow. I want to see that person have penance. And I want to see that person change in a very positive way. Because that's way more impactful. And I, I think that we as a culture have gotten way too far, and like I said before, to this torch and pitchfork mentality. Again, Jemmy was not going to be long for that job. And I think that that is right, given what I saw. Michigan needed to be smarter. Shemi needed a lesson learned. But I hope that those out there who are, uh, who want to pile on, uh, that you're, you're not really doing a, any kind of movement, any service, because that hardens people's hearts. If someone comes and starts screaming at you and calling you names and things, does, does that really make you change? Probably not. So... Uh, I say that again because I've seen I've seen what social media has looked like in the aftermath of it what, as it was coming. And I, I just I think that there's a better way. So, um, again, I know we're not all going to agree on a lot of things. I know this is a very different episode than what we're used to doing here. It was on my heart to do this and to speak a little bit more from experience, speak a little bit more from a, a perspective of giving people grace, because if we were in. A situation where either we didn't know something was wrong or we knew something was wrong and we were just misguided. We would hope that our fellow neighbors, people in our community, this Michigan community would have a little bit of grace and forgiveness with us and walk us into the right place. I hope that uh, I hope that that message is clear and uh, I hope that uh, you all have an amazing blessed day. So that's my that's my spiel. We will be back on Tuesday to discuss whatever the latest news is in uh, Michigan football, maybe Michigan basketball, probably not basketball. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon. Peace. Peace.